All right, so this panel is protecting the enterprise, the human element. Um, and I'd like to call my panelists up to the stage. Uh, first, we have Lou Briscoe, who's the Vice President and Head of Information Security Operations Center at Thomson Reuters. Thank you. Hi, Lou. How are you doing? Good. <laughs> um, James Foster, CEO and co-founder of Zero Fox. Welcome. Neha Gupta, who's the Managing Director of Global Products uh, Management at True Office. Thank you. Which is a workbench affiliate. Yeah. As I understand. Uh, and Dimitri Sirota, SVP of Strategy and Security at CA Technologies. All right. So I'd like to have each of you just give a very brief kind of like one sentence description of what your companies do and what you identify as the biggest problem um, with the human element as it pertains to security. Okay. So we'll start off with you, Lou, because okay, you're closest to me. Thanks. Uh, Lou Briscoe. And I, uh, the, uh, I'm responsible for the, the SOC for Thomson Reuters. It's really a, a SOC and a CERT, and I run the forensic services for the company, and it is globally. I've got uh, folks in, in, uh, in the U.S., in, in London, and in Singapore for a follow the sun model. And probably my, my biggest challenge is finding talent that's qualified to do the work that we need to do. We, we cover a wide range of things. And, and, and then I've got to keep that talent. I'm worried about... My solution has been to, to bring in new people and train them because the talent isn't out there and I've got to make sure that I can keep them after I've trained them. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my biggest challenge. James. Yeah, thanks. Uh, James Foster, co-founder and CEO of Zero Fox. We started about a year ago. We've got about 55 people today. Uh, we're headquartered down in Baltimore and we are challenging the social aspect of cybersecurity. Uh, if you think back about how much money was sunk into email security and device protection, uh, we're doing the same thing for enterprises via the social, the social sphere. I'll tell you a little bit more today. Great. Hi, everybody. I'm Neha Gupta. Uh, I oversee product management at True Office. We are an interactive learning technology company that's kind of challenging how we educate people. So to lose point, right? It's it's great that there's a talent short. I mean, it's unfortunate there's a talent shortage. You need effective ways to train people. And the biggest challenge I find, my past life, I used to oversee institutional technology at City. And the biggest challenge was, how do you get the rank and file employee to actually not do stupid things? Uh, Dimitri Sirota was a co-founder of an API security company, which sold about a year ago to CA Technologies. I'm currently in charge of uh, strategy for the security division of CA. Um, and the kind of biggest problem I think that uh, we all have to contend with is that humans are trusting by nature. And so as trusting people, they do things uh, you know, that are trusting. And in this day and age, you, don't, you can't always trust who emails you or, or who accesses your system and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I want to start with maybe the elephant in the room, which is human fallibility. Um, your network is only going to be as strong as its weakest link. Uh, and one of the major vulnerabilities is phishing. Um, that's the way that most hacks are executed nowadays. Uh, so you're always going to have somebody doing something dumb. Somebody's going to click on something they shouldn't or leave a device somewhere that they shouldn't. Um, James, is there any hope? <laughs> well, Not to be too nihilistic, but... No, I, I'm <laughs> glad that you picked me first. I mean, sure, you can <laughs> work with Zero Fox to start. Um, no, I, look, I think uh, that's a challenge that's been around for as long as security has been in business. Uh, and I don't think it's going anywhere you know, I'll give a very biased opinion on why it's more prominent now than ever. Uh, and that's just due to the rise of social media. I mean, if you think about phishing attacks and how they've evolved over the last 15 years, it was very difficult to identify phishing attacks 10 years ago because you had very little context. It was an email, and you either trusted that email or you didn't. But now, I can put together a well-crafted email with just about information that's available via uh, the public internet on people. And I can find out who their friends are, and I can put some attacks together that, that look completely legitimate uh, to kind of get past that frontline defense. And I think not only has social media created the ability to create um, more vulnerable enterprise systems, it's what I've called is it's really exponentially increased the attack footprint. So if you think about the attack footprint that organizations had to protect years ago, you've seen that grow because organizations were worried about networks and devices and systems. And unless you had a military background, you had a real fundamental challenge on identifying uh, uh, problems that were people-centric, right? So we walk in and talk to a CISO and say, look, you understand if your applications are under attack or your networks, you stop those things. But what if I said, 
that John here was under attack. What do you do? And that mindset and that shift in corporate America, I think, is just now starting to, well, I don't know what I do if you tell me that John's under attack, but it starts at the top, and you're going to start to have policies that say, this is what happens when people are under attack, and I use people as that vulnerable weak link to get to the systems and the devices. Um, we help out with some of that. <laughs> so people and companies uh, are not always equal in every regard. Uh, there are, you know, you have all different levels within a company. Um, how do you go about identifying where your vulnerabilities are? Uh, Neha. Um, I think measurement is so key, right? So actually, to kind of build on James' point, to know that John's under attack, you have to actually assess kind of who within your organization is that weakest link. What's your bottom 5%? What's your bottom 10%? And you measure it on multiple di dimensions, right? One is obviously systems. You check kind of where you're getting uh, penetrated, who pen tests for phishing, for example, who click where. But then you also can use technology in the modern day. True Office, for example, is entirely framed around the premise of having interactive learning technology that actually gives the firm back proficiency analytics, showing you your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So you can say, okay, three out of these five are under attack. Now go do something about it, and here's what they're under attack with. Sure. You're looking at me, so yeah. you, maybe you want me to <laughs> jump in. Extend that. Yeah. So I think the, you know, the good news is there are tools available from a whole host of vendors uh, that help you better identify which users have privileged access to systems. So because of that, you could, um, you could regulate you know, what they're allowed to do, when they're allowed to do it. Uh, on top of that, you could track them, you could follow them, you could look for unusual anomalies in their behavior. So there are systems to help that. Um, obviously, from a human factor, it doesn't stop a rogue agent, a rogue employee, a rogue consumer from doing um, things that they shouldn't be doing, whether they're unethical or illegal. Um, but there are tools, again, to provide governance um, and to provide detection, early warning. And then, luckily, there's also tools for defense. Yeah. It's sort of though you've got to get into the, not, not just the who has permissions, but who has the access to your, or control of your reputation. Because there's some people who, whose word means something and can damage your reputation just by them saying it. So they're, they're just as important to protect as the people who have keys to the kingdom, so to, so to speak. <laughs> um, so many people, through no fault of their own, are very security ignorant. Um, how do you go about teaching those people to become more proactive in protecting themselves and others? Uh, I'll toss this one to well, you. And actually, I'm going to throw back yet another question because the problem uh -huh. we faced is even after we train them, it, it was, it's almost backfired as much as it's, as it's helped. For instance, <laughs> I'm finding I'm getting more questionable re response about legitimate emails that were poorly crafted as, is this phishing? And it really did come from HR as opposed to them then happily clicking on the one that really did come from the bad guy. So it's a, it seems like the more I teach them, the more it's, a, it's a not really helping things. <laughs> I think education has to be holistic, right? It has to be very real. If you send out a 10-page PowerPoint and say, read this on the best information security practices, I could be very honest, I've always put them on the second screen, wait till it's time to click next and keep going, right? So it has to be very real, it has to be very experiential, and you have to give people a place to experiment and almost fail, right? So to your point, kind of, the reason we get so many questions on, oh my God, is this phishing, is because people don't really know kind of what happens when you try something and it goes wrong and then you still can fix it in a safe environment. And I think that's a big part. The second piece is education can't just be about the eight hours you spend in the workplace. In the previous panel, BYOD was brought up. You know, now it's not even just the employee clicking on something stupid. It's the employee's iPad, which has work email on it. It gives it to his son to play with and the son happens to just be clicking around and ends up clicking on something they really shouldn't be, right? So we have to look at education as really a holistic suite where we're monitoring who is doing BYOD, okay? Maybe there needs to be a certain type of education attached to that. Um, generic education that's not just about, here are the rules, check the box, you've done it. Let's actually get some, some real assessment and practice to them so they feel secure. So I think education will always have a limit to, to the results that you're going to benefit from or that you're going to receive. And part of that is because every couple of years there's a whole new wave of technology that comes, comes into the market. And most of us are, are getting older, not younger, and we become less familiar with the new tools. And so we, we need to learn over again, and it becomes harder and harder. And so I think what you're seeing is um, a devolution from this kind of need to kind of ensure people have uh, compliance and, and you know, perfectly educated towards uh, tools that essentially uh, make up for the fallibility of people. They either identify uh, kind of bad behavior uh, early 
Uh, and then secondly, they, they provide kind of contextual and passive uh, security. So based on where you are, you may get a different type of security challenge than um, if you were, let's say, visiting you know, another country or outside of your office. So I think the tools need to evolve because I think there's always going to be a limit to the education in part because the technology itself changes so rapidly. Well, and the bad guys are getting smarter, so they're, they're crafting things that are tougher to do. I'm finding just as many people who really understand to what to watch out for are still getting the phishing messages that are really in intensely organized, and they're, they're, they can't resist the urge to click on them. I've had some people who afterwards cannot believe that, that, they, that they fell for it, because they are. So I think the answer really is not, not necessarily in educating people, as building these you know, defense in depth systems to catch that. And, and, and again, back to my earlier statement about you know, people educating the people about uh, not necessarily on clicking on the fish on what constitutes a good phishing email, but helping the people who craft messages to the whole company on how to write good messages that don't look like they're, that won't look like they're, they're phishing. That's where I've had greater success in that area than, than in, in the user end. Hackers are, are taking grammar classes in HR. And <laughs> they <so> are. are. <laughs> Going I, think the, uh, yeah. I don't know a single CISO where education is not a part of their strategic framework or their defense and depth strategy. Although I think one of the challenges that the, the CISO and the executive leadership of these large organizations are going to have for the next couple of years is who gets that training. Whereas before, when you really focused around cybersecurity or information security training, you, you focused really on the people that you thought were users, the people that you thought were highly effective. We're now, again, a personal bias to our organization, what we do, we get the question now of, well, shouldn't you train our executive team uh, maybe people that are associated with the company but not employees, and their family members. Uh, you know, very live, real cases on Fortune 100 companies that have signed up and said, our families are being attacked to get to us. I think this is also a new paradigm shift of challenges that, talk about next generation challenges executives are going to have to face. What's your policy on training people that aren't employed at your organization? And what is your risk tolerance on, okay, well, if they can be attacked to get to me, whether it's a crafted phishing email or something else, that's one step removed now where I have to deal with the ramifications of that where now there's malware on my network or malware being sent to somebody from another trusted individual. This happens all the time. Um, and so you think about education and where that, that kind of crosses that path. Uh, I think that that's a challenge. And then just to go off to something Niha said as well, I think, uh, I think you're spot on with the training's got to adapt. One of the things that we've done as well is we've tried to go, uh, use micro training so under 30 seconds worth of training on how to use the product, right? No one wants to sit down and take a four-hour class, a two-day work session. We give you bits and pieces on 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there. If you want to know how to do something, it should be intuitive. If you have to sit down for two days on how to learn it, you're probably not building a next generation software application. And if it's not intuitive, search for it, find the 30 seconds of content that you want, and then learn how to use it on the spot. And that way we've seen implementation times go from months and weeks down to hours major organizations. You're so spot on. I mean, back in the day, the tools weren't there to do anything with it, right? One of the challenges when you start broadening the scope of who gets this training or what are you training people on, it has to be actually adaptive, right? So if I'm an expert and say somebody in front of me isn't, we shouldn't both be put through the exact same thing piece by piece. It's the solution has to meet me where my proficiency level is and adapt accordingly. And fortunately, those tools now are out there thanks to companies like ourselves. <laughs> yeah, I really want to emphasize another point you made on, with, with that supply chain there. Is I, I find most of the attacks against our company, by far the majority, not 98%, not but probably, in the, I'm guessing, in the 60% range, are, are related to the supply chain. Either they're trying to get to our customer, so they're, they're trying to attack us to, to get to our, who, who our customer is, or they're trying to get to us through one of our customers. So one of, the, one of those two aspects is, is where a lot of the attacks are coming from nowadays. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dimitri, so have you noticed, uh, you know, as this space has been evolving, has it become easier to prey on people? Yeah, well, I think the, the approaches, you know, we were just discussing this uh, kind of before we came up to the, um, uh, up here. Um, one of the things I was reading about is how some, some organizations, you know, some certain media organizations do these trivia tests where they're essentially looking to capture your personal data, which then they could broker to, um, to third parties. So you're essentially, they're encouraging you to give up uh, your personal data um, in exchange for a trivia, you know, where which city you would normally live in or, or things of that sort. Um, so what's fascinating about this is, of course, most of us would not really regard that as uh, social hacking. You know, their, their intentions are not nefarious, they're commercial. But nevertheless, I think we're all getting exposed to it and because it's new and unexpected, we don't realize that it is a form of 
privacy, not necessarily invasion, but certainly um, uh, privacy access. And I think from there you could see how things like social hacking happen with, these, with this whole iCloud incident. People aren't expecting it. And so I do think that um, there is this evolution. Again, by nature we're trusting. And so as these new techno technologies get introduced, we're very forgiving in terms of trusting people, giving up our information in, uh, in new ways. Mm -hmm. You have to be one step ahead of the curve, right? So you can't wait to be reactive. After something blows up and you say, oh, by the way, this new technology came out, you should watch out for this, you have to actually have people, and this goes back to kind of having the talented people who are plugged into the industry enough to know what those trends are, where the market's shifting. You have to get ahead of the curve and actually send that messaging out to your folks before something blows up and then you say, oh, by the way, if you're using that, don't do this. So is it that people need to become smarter about security or do we just need smarter tools and technology? Uh, it, you know, it's, it's both. It's got to be both. Better gadgets. Because they're, they're, you know, they're, so we're, you know, we're playing this, this game, so they're, they up the game, we've got up our game and, and back and forth. And there's no, they're always going to be ahead in some steps and we've got to, so we have to have the technology to back it up, but we've got to have the training to, to, to keep us on, on pace. Mm -hmm. Now, Lou, as we discussed earlier, uh, you said that you, one of your big problems is that you need to build a pipeline of talent uh, right. within your company. You can't find the people to fill your spaces. Um, there are a lot of vacancies. I forget the number, but it's like 40 to 50% of the, the security positions that uh, are open. They're just not the experts to fill it. Um, so what is your solution to that? So, so, you know, we still post for looking for the expert looking for, and hoping that we'll, 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 we'll get some snag somebody. But I always post, in, but I always post in parallel for, for uh, you know, somebody who's got some of the technical background. And I, what we're doing is we're, I'm looking for someone who's got those skills, that mental, that, that troubleshooting skill, that, that almost white hacker sense, of, of, uh, sense of, of, of being. And I try to look for those skills in that individual, and then I bring them in and train them and, and say, you know, this is, listen, you don't have the skills we need, we're willing to train you up in it, we want you to, we want you to come on board. And then, and then I've got to make them happy when they stay and, and somebody else wants to buy the, the you know, the, the fully trained person uh, to, to do that. So that, that's my, that's kind of my strategy is keeping them up, is training them in, in place. Mm -hmm. With high demand and low supply, how do you, <laughs> how do you keep these people uh, within your company? Actually, how do you retain them? Well, so, uh, so uh, a lot of it's work atmosphere. So they've got, first of all, we're a, a very diverse company, Thomson Reuters is. So I've got, there's a lot of challenges to keep them technically challenged. A lot of di different kinds of aspects we're in, in the industry. But, th but the other one is just creating a, an environment where they feel like they're in control. Uh, you know, I, I, don't, wait, I don't set hard work hours. I just d expect coverage. In, in, in fact, it's kind of ironic sometimes that when I, when I expect like, a, you know, I've got, I have people in, in every time zone to kind of co cover that. It, it's amazing the number of times I find that the, that the guys at the, it's two in the morning their time are the ones who are most responding to the, to the attack as opposed to the guy who it's 10 o'clock in the morning their time are, are still, still asleep probably. Uh, and so the, the, having that, that flexible atmosphere as long as there's coverage, is, it, it goes a long way uh, to keeping that. And then having them with the right, the right tools and the right, the right capabilities and, and giving them opportunities to grow. I, I've kept my training budget just by the fact that I have to train them I've kept my training budget is almost four times what the, the company standard is because I know that I've got to, one, I've, I've got to train them to fill that role because they weren't ready for the role to begin with, and that's how I'm keeping them. Is that by, and, and quite frankly, the bad guys are, are always a, seem to be a step ahead of the game, so we have to be trained, well-trained right up, right up front. So that, that training keeps those people excited. I think that's right. I think uh, you know, my tagline in the company is we recruit like we're a basketball team. You know, this is going to be a, a starved industry for talent for years to come, um, and I think it takes a special person. The nice thing about this industry in general is that it changes every day. You find the right kind of people that want constant change, and they want to feel like there's competition out there. This is a win for them, right? Because very few industries in IT, and most people in the security industry sometimes forget about this, have real competition, right? Forget about the business competition, your competitor across the aisle at the trade show, who's got the new hat that looks better than yours this month, but I'm talking about, in addition to that, you've got people, overseas people in your backyard that are trying to compromise your companies and your partners that you're working with and trying to beat your technology. It's very exciting to be a younger person entering the workforce and saying, okay, you're gonna build this thing that detects bad people doing bad things, and you've gotta be better than them. And all of a sudden, if you find those hidden type A's that go, ooh, I like this, I wanna win, right? I just want to beat that person and find somebody and not have them know that I'm on to what they're doing. 
it can get very, very exciting. The other thing is, talk about big data, and you know, we get applications for data scientists all the time now, in addition to developers. The, the law of big numbers is in the security industry. So you find something bad, you find somebody doing something bad, odds are it can be replicated millions of times over. And that's also technically exciting for you know, people on the, the defensive side of the house or the offensive side of the house. So um, we get them in the door, we typically don't lose them, and we go really hard to try to get them in the door. <laughs> I think the biggest thing is exactly this, right? They, it, traditionally, if you think of kind of your, your security officers, they were these checklist people. We reviewed entitlements, we reviewed that you know, there were no breaches, all systems seemed green, we're good. And you can't have that mentality anymore. That's just not the environment we live in. And so all of these things that, that both you know, James and Lou are talking about kind of feed into building that culture where these people are innovators. They're drivers for your business. They're not supposed to be just you know, monitors, if you will. And I think that helps actually kind of feed and find those type of people because that is very exciting. Sorry. Have you encountered a, a skill gap, uh, Dimitri? Yeah, look, I think the skills are out there. I think any in-demand skill is hard to find and, you know, there's two solutions. One is you, uh, you pay more and that, and that kind of tends to solve many things. And if failing that, you import it, right? You do things like immigration reform to allow more to come in. So th there's definitely people out there with the skills, right? Now, there's more competition for those skills. But again, you know, I think the market kind of has solutions for that. Actually, I, I'd, almost, I'd almost disagree on that one. I don't, I don't think this, the people, there are enough people out there with the skills that we need to go around to, uh, to everybody. So I, I think it's, we, we are going to have to train to, to, to fill that gap. We're going to have to fi find the people who, are, who have the beginnings of those skills and are sharp and have that mentality of the right thinking and then, and then, and then train them on that. Yeah, but you could argue like Accenture or um, Anderson or whatever they used to be called, but Accenture does that, you know, as they recruit straight out of university and then they train for a couple of years and you learn on the job. So I don't think that's, that's new or, or novel. That's just the way people have been doing things for ages. And I would hope that most organizations here do have a training uh, program and a, almost an apprenticeship program where you learn, uh, you know, under, under somebody. So uh, again, I don't think there's n necessarily anything new under the sun. It's just that this is an in-demand scale and a fast-moving uh, industry and there's more competition for those types of uh, talents. And so, you know, we have uh, mechanisms to, to address that. Uh, so you mentioned it's a fast-moving industry. Uh, how have you seen the space evolving? over the past decade, let's say? How, how have attacks evolved against people? Uh, what changes have you seen? For me? Sure. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've, I've been in the industry almost exactly a decade. Um, <laughs> so, um, Perfect. Yeah, exactly. So let me tell you how it was day one. Um, yeah, look, I think that there's more exposure because there's more, um, we have more interaction with the internet. So I always kind of had the benefit of being part of that kind of first generation of internet um, uh, companies. I actually had a, my first company um, was in the late 90s. And of course, back then, mobile wasn't that important. We had mobile, you know, some of you may not be aware of that, but we did. Uh, but you were dealing with CDPD and, you know, kind of like dial-up speeds, those type of things. So that wasn't really representative of a vector for attack. It wasn't that much of a concern. You didn't have data on your phone, et cetera. So I think, you know, clearly as the technology's evolved, as we've all become connected to the internet, as our homes become connected, and soon your, you know, your lock will be connected to the internet. So these vectors are changing and these create kind of exposures for you personally, for your family, for your business, for your organization. Um, so I think that's changed, but also the mechanisms to deal with that have also changed. So I think the two biggest trends that we see at, at CA is one around uh, big data analytics, creating this kind of smart intelligence, being able to detect early uh, something that looks unusual um, and, and warrants some type of defensive um, uh, posture or action. Secondly is this idea of kind of passive um, uh, security, meaning that you could get a security that's appropriate to what you're doing and where you are. So it's contextual based on you. So if you're in your office, you know, we'll trust that you actually belong to the corporation. If you're somewhere in Russia trying to access something from a mobile device that has never been connected to the corporate network, maybe we're going to trust you a little bit less and we're going to create this kind of step up mechanism. So I think this, this whole idea of being able to create a level of security appropriate for where you are, and then secondly, this kind of analytics to be able to uh, provide insight and automatic kind of um, analysis, I think are both two big trends that we've seen as a result of all these new kind of points of exposure that we have. Mm -hmm. Of course, one of, our one of our challenges to that is we're 
being a global company, I think a lot of companies are moving global, is it's getting tough to say, I'm not going to trust it based on location because we've got, you know, we have a, a huge workforce in China. We have a, we have, we have, being a journalist company too, a news company, we have journalists in, in many countries that are, that are obscure or, or would normally set up other red flags. So it's, a, it's an extra challenge on, on top of that. Neha, at True Office, you've, you have some interesting data on how different cultures handle different uh, security vulnerabilities. We, um, we do, and actually, it's, it's interesting, Lou, that you bring this up because it kind of ties back to that holistic point, right, which is you have to have a baseline for your organization and be able to say, okay, in Latin America, we find that inherently it's a much more social culture. They're sort of less careful about you know, sharing badge access and fine, you forgot yours, here's mine, go have fun to you know, Asia being a bit less conscious with password management. But in order to even get to those trends, to identify what are those kind of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for your organization, there has to be an underlying activity which is a combination of education and assessment. And assessment can't be like a 10 question quiz that, hey, you're going to Russia, answer these 10 questions. Do you, like if you pass, great, we trust you, or if you don't pass, we don't. It has to be contextual, it has to be immersive, right? Almost put them in a safe environment and kind of let them make some mistakes. If they make the mistakes you don't really want them to make, that's kind of, I think, how we need to start establishing baseline and really get to that very targeted reinforcement and coaching. Um, the one other thing I want to mention just from an evolution perspective is, you know, clearly phishing, social engineering, this whole piece is, is very important and becoming much to light because it's, it's been, it's new, right? Um, we still can't forget that, and I could, from my past life, very much attest to this, that there's still, Tons of security incidents that happen because people forget their laptop somewhere. They travel with files on airplanes and then happen to sit at a bar and forget about it. Or they're shoulder surfing, right? And so we have to kind of manage both sides of the coin. The systems can help us with evolving technology, but ultimately the people risk remains because humans will interact with humans, humans will travel, humans will do things that they have to almost live and breathe the culture of security. But what am I doing? Is this smart or not? James, I'm interested to hear what you have to say about the evolution of attacks, too, because you're in the social space, and I, uh, being on Twitter, I've received direct messages from close friends that are just like single links, and I'm like, this is very <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> not got a great work. program for you. <laughs> yeah. uh, so look, in, in the late 90s, I was working for the Department of Defense, and if you wanted to go after people back then, there were a lot of different ways to do that quickly, but you look up who is information via you know, a company's DNS, and the reason you do that is you get back an email address. Why do you need that email address? That was before all the privacy stuff was around and you could privacy protect your domain. So you could get the way and the, the kind of connotation that emails were created for that. And then that way you could send emails 15 years ago to executives or targets that you had because you'd go on the websites and go, oh, well, here's the executive leadership team. I now know how email addresses are used. Therefore, I send all those email addresses or all those people emails that are well-crafted malicious. Now I don't need to do any of that stuff. Now it's fully automated and I can stick 5,000 botnets via social on every employee that's in the firm in five minutes. And it cost me about $10 to do that. And it, the, the, the trio triage of what's happened here is volume, right? You hear people say things like big data. You hear people say, oh, the attacks are getting worse. It's because it's a volume game. The cost of an attack has gone down and the sophistication level has gone down. Therefore, it goes back to economics. That means I can execute more attacks at the same time for a cheaper cost, meaning that I'm going to launch more and just hope that one hits. So as an organization, I think the, the takeaway here is you need to make sure that you're building an organization to defend your company and the things that matter most at scale and determine what that scale really is. Um, I think big data is out there because a lot of products are terrible. Um, they produce too much and they make too much noise. So then they say, hey, we've got big data. Now you've got to filter through it and find the important stuff. Why haven't you found the important stuff for me? and just told me the five things I need to really worry about. And I think that's it's part of this maturation curve we'll see over the next few years too with big data and the security space. So uh, I think we're wrapping up now. Uh, we've got about two minutes left. Uh, so I'd just like to get sort of a 30 second wrap up from each of you. Uh, I guess circling back to the beginning, what you identified as sort of the biggest problem for you with the human element um, and just kind of closing messages and, and final thoughts. So. We'll go down the line. We'll start with you, Lou. Right. But you know, again, my, my biggest challenge is, re, uh, is finding 
good talent in, in keeping them, and I already kind of think I already covered how I, my challenges in doing that. And the other, one, the, the other big one is I think just this defense in depth, depth strategy is that I'm, I'm assuming that the people are, are going to continue to be vulnerable no matter how much I train them, and I've got to have lots of, lots of places to catch what they're, when, when they make mistakes. Mm -hmm. uh, Lou's challenge is my challenge. Finding great people is going to be really tough, uh, and it's always tough for successful organizations to find really good people. Uh, I would say that our customers, though, we're helping them with, with a fundamentally new paradigm shift. Um, social is cloud-oriented on day one, and the data doesn't live on your network, and it's not going to be controlled by you. So how do you help an organization say, there's a new attack footprint out there, it's called social media. You don't get to control it, you don't get to see the data, you probably don't get to see any of the real messages. How do I get my arms around that, and how do I decrease the risk for my organization that this is causing? Um, and that's, that's it's been tough. and. That's why we're here. Um, I think the, the piece that's sort of core to all of this is culture. Right? At the end of the day, reminding people what's in it for them, not just for the firm, why they need to have secure practices both at home and in the workplace and kind of everything they do is what's going to help tackle a lot of these while the technology sort of catches up and continues to evolve. Um, and it is, it is about you know, the kind of things we're doing in the marketplace with being able to meet the individual at their proficiency level, finding out exactly what they understand, what they don't, and help them remediate just that. So it's not four hours of training, it's 30 seconds. Have Take experience. us home, Dimitri. Sure. So, you know, in conclusion, I'll come back to the beginning. You know, people are fallible, right? We, we evolve trusting our little community, and it just so happens that on the internet, internet, our community is enormous. Um, I think that there are technologies that are coming to market that essentially cocoon us uh, through big data and through some of these kind of contextual authentication uh, that will help. But I think the big um, surprise and the big kind of um, innovation over the next couple of years will actually be things that some of you already have in the five, iPhone 5S and the iPhone 6, which is really to be able to solve this trust issue is identification, being able to know who is on the other side. And now with the advent of wearables, soon some of you will have iPhone, um, iPhone watches or iWatches rather, um, and again, these next generation of handsets, um, it's going to be easier to identify who is on the other side. So you could again build that trust and solve some, for some of these problems that the, around fallibility of humans, just that we trust anybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, thank you all so much.